thank you very much for uh, coming to our staff meeting, which is also going to serve as a professional development opportunity for all of us. Um, you've met me before. My name is Justin Chapman, and I am uh, part of a um, reading writing specialist practicum right now. So we have to do all the different parts of the, uh, the reading writing specialist job. So um, you may remember the survey, and I'll kind of get into the survey in a second. Uh, they came to you maybe a month ago, a month and a half ago, um, asking what language arts, literacy, uh, things you'd like to have some professional development done with, and um, speaking and listening skills as they relate to the Common Core was one that kind of rose to the top. Um, so I will uh, talk, take you through the process of how I came to share the idea of Socratic seminars, which you may or may not be familiar with, but you will be by the end. Um, so uh, as a future potential reading writing specialist, um, trying to do all the different parts of it of the, of the job. It's not just teaching reading or teaching remedial reading, um, but a big part of it is leading professional development. That's kind of the, the new model for our literacy coaches, um, and so trying to uh, experience that part um, along with you today. So thanks for taking the time to complete that survey. Um, the results did show a strong interest in learning more about um, speaking, listening, uh, viewing, and representing skills. And so we're going to focus on the listening and speaking skills today. Uh, and I think you'll um, enjoy what we have to offer. This was, uh, there were four people that responded to the survey. I think it went out to about six of you, um, maybe seven of you. So uh, a pretty good sample. Um, and all four of you that responded uh, expressed interest in this area. Um, and it was by far the one that most people wanted. A lot of people in the other survey questions, there were some, some ones and twos. Um, the survey questions were generated from a meeting that I had with John about um, some things that he and I thought might be helpful. Um, and so as we looked across all of this, I said, that's where we're going to focus our energy. Um, and you can see that uh, three quarters of you thought that of the topics that I mentioned, that would be the most beneficial to you today. So hopefully there's some a feeling of, yeah, okay, this is something that, um, that I was interested in and want to, uh, to learn more about. Um, if you're the spelling person, I apologize, we're not going to get to spelling today, um, but uh, hopefully um, you'll be able to still walk away with something that you might find uh, valuable after this. So the big part is looking at uh, Common Core state standards and looking at the different um, aspects of listening and speaking skills. And so I pulled some samples of kindergarten, third grade, and sixth grade, so you can see kind of how that language changes over time, um, over, the, over the different years. but. There's some very common threads, as we know, with all Common Core, you know, it builds on itself as years go on. Um, so participating in collaborative conversations is a big part um, of, this is at the kindergarten level. Um, following agreed upon rules for those discussions is also really important. Um, and having multiple exchanges, so the conversation continues to go back and forth, um, and, and it gets richer as it goes on. Um, at the third grade level, again, collaborative discussions pops up. Um, now we're not just having discussions, but we're building on each other's ideas, um, trying to make them more clear, uh, understand them better, coming to discussions prepared. So here's a new part where there's some expectation on the learner's behalf that they um, have read something or viewed something ahead of time, they have uh, some, done some preparation, and that during that conversation they can draw from their preparation. So they've, they've done a little background work ahead of time. Again, following upon those rules of discussion, um, finding respectful ways to enter the conversation, listening to each other, making good eye contact, uh, taking turns in that discussion. Um, continues on with third grade. This is more third grade, but now the kids are responsible for asking you questions today. Um, you kind of see how this works. And so I've been trying them out in my own classroom for the last couple of weeks. Um, I've been using a website called Paideia, uh, which is basically a um, professional development group that tries to bring the Socratic method or what they call Socratic seminars to schools. They'll train whole groups of schools, um, but they have a lot of resources uh, where you can go on and find um, uh, lesson plans that you can use. And we'll use one of those ones today. I've used two others, um, one that focused on the Sorcerer's Apprentice, um, a segment from Disney's Fantasia, um, one that focused on the Pledge of Allegiance, and then one that I created on my own, so looking at some short novels written by Mildred Taylor, the students all wrote, and I uh, generated the questions that went into that. 
Socratic seminar. Uh, we used a one circle format here, and we'll talk about the formats in a second, but basically people sit in a circle uh, to have these Socratic seminars. But there's also something called concentric circles, and I'll talk about what that is. That's a circle within a circle and kind of a fishbowl type exercise. So um, we'll, we'll look at that. That was a really uh, kind of fascinating experience for me, and I'll share kind of both models for you. Today, because we're a small group, we're going to do a one circle um, seminar, but I'll talk to you about how the concentric circles works, so you can consider using that in the future. Um, so Socratic seminar format. Discussion is based on one text that all participants have previously read or viewed. Uh, typically it's short. Um, we're not looking to have a Socratic seminar with full-length novels. The Mildred Taylor short novels that I used was kind of a, a stretch from that, um, but I wanted to kind of try it out. And uh, it worked, worked pretty well, but if you have something short enough that everyone can look at and really read in depth and know inside and out, um, that works really well because everyone's you know, very familiar with the material. Uh, participants sit in a circle. The leader asks open-ended questions. There are no right or wrong answers. So it's, you know, even though the leader might be feigning ignorance with a belief as to where the conversation might go, the students, the participants can certainly take it in any direction. Um, and their responses to questions might generate new questions. So as the leader, you might be thinking, where can I dovetail in a new question based on where the conversation went? But the students themselves can also be the ones creating new questions, and um, your conversation might end up going a new path based on where the students uh, want to or need to go. Um, leader's responsibility. So I'll be serving the role as leader today. Uh, but the leader's responsibility is to remind participants of the purpose of and expectations for the seminar, and we'll look at what some of those are in a second, uh, to ask open-ended questions and to ask follow-up questions, so paying close attention to the conversation so that you can uh, jump in when necessary. Um, if the conversation starts to get off track, if they end up on tangents and it really isn't uh, being productive, then it's okay for the, uh, the leader to step in and to say, you know, maybe summarize something of what's been said so far, bring them back on track. Uh, taking notes, both about what the students are saying as well as who's participating. And I'll show you a couple of different methods for doing that, one that I uh, really enjoy um, called spider webbing. And um, invites participants who are reluctant to join in to join in. So it is easy to find yourself in a Socratic seminar where two or three or four participants are kind of running the show and a few are sitting way back and when I first did this with the Fantasia one, um, this was difficult for me. I was, I was trying to hope that certain students would kind of come to the conversation on their own. They didn't. I didn't do as good a job as I needed to to start to invite them. I got better at it with Pledge of Allegiance. And um, by the time we were doing the Mildred Taylor novels, um, the students themselves were the ones inviting students to participate. So that was, that was a really neat thing. And, uh, and as they get better at it, there's higher expectations for what they um, will do, and, and it works out, works out really well. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm going to step back a second and just share that I had never led a Socratic seminar prior to doing uh, get, getting ready for this professional development. What I did was taking your feedback of what you wanted to learn about. I said, oh, okay, what, what could I learn about myself that would help them learn about speaking and listening. So it wasn't like I was coming out. They need more work on speaking and listening skills. I'm the expert. I will share with them what I already know. It was me going and doing research. So I, I began. All right. So welcome to our Socratic seminar on Big Bird by Maya Angelou. Hopefully you've all had a chance to read the poem and give it that inspectional read. If not, that's okay. We'll, we'll get into it together. Um, but if you've done the preparation work at a time, which is an important part of uh, Socratic seminar, you'll be that much more prepared, I think, uh, looking forward to your part in this. Um, one, yeah. one thing I'd like you to do at this point is to uh, set a, let's start with a personal goal first, actually. Um, set a personal goal. So on your paper that you have in front of you um, that I just handed out, so before the seminar, set one personal goal you have for discussion. And here are some examples of goals that people could choose. Um, if you're new to Socratic Seminar or you're someone who's a little bit anxious in group conversations, this could be uh, a good column to choose from. If you're feeling like, yeah, I'm pretty skilled and I'm ready for this, uh, you know, have this kind of experience before, 
Um, you might pick something from over here. Um, but whatever you are most comfortable with, you would set your own personal goal. Um, so take about 30 seconds. Choose one and jot it down like this. Okay, to use a different one if you Absolutely. want to. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yep. I mean, it should be related to right. speaking and listening to be part of mm -hmm. the conversation. Um, but yeah, anything that you think would work well for you. This tune is heard on the dis distant hill where the caged bird sings of freedom. seminar by asking this opening question, and that is, what idea or values are embodied in the culture now? And we'll open it up to the discussion part. Um, as we re review this list, and you can look up there to kind of see what other people were thinking as well as, you know, how similar or different it was to your own. Um, where do you see these values and ideas within the text? So you could be talking about one of your own pieces and where you see it in the text, or you could comment on somebody else's. You could say, oh, let's you know, see where uh, John was thinking when he said that at this point. And I'm going to remind you all to reference the text as much as we can during this. I, um, Jennifer's idea of openness, really, what right, right when you said that, Jennifer, um, I, I got it. stanza, it says the free bird dares to claim the sky, and then down in the fourth stanza, it says he names the sky his own wing. So I, it just felt like the possibility is there to do anything, and you think it, and then you're able to do it. Yeah, that kind of connects to the idea of the joy, the freedom, experiencing life in its own way. Like, there's Stop right there. So, uh, if we had more time, I probably would have held off to allow that one to have a little more, but I'm certainly mindful of, of your all time, your time as well. So, thank you very much for participating in that. Um, wanted to share um, one way that I was tracking what was happening in that conversation. Mm -hmm. So, this is uh, a spider web. Um, basically, uh, as the conversation moves around the circle, I would uh, draw the line of who it went to. And so, you can use this afterwards to keep track of you know, who was participating, were there um, clear back and forth between two people, or was it, or was it spread out? Um, this uh, is a pretty nice spread. I've, I've done now these with, <laughs> with two people, so you know, it, 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 it works well. You know, you're, 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 uh, you're, as a group, um, very pro-social in the way that you would encourage each other to participate um, and give each other opportunities. Um, and then I also was creating a little, a little key to myself, um, at, you know, who mentions metaphor, who makes a text reference, who uses somebody else's name, who raises a question, who invites somebody else to speak, um, that sort of thing, so that as I'm watching that, I can um, uh, you know, know if I need to draw somebody else in or if I need to talk to somebody about their participation before the next seminar, um, that sort of thing, too. You know, so it gives me that, that opportunity. And that when I first did this, I would try to have all the, just a class list of the kids, and I was trying to take notes that way, and it was almost impossible, to like, especially with 22 kids yeah. in one big circle. But to go down that list and find, oh, 